June 15, 2019. An evangelical megastars Anderson de Carmo de Souza and his wife, Flor de Lish dos Santos, are taking in an evening drive along Rio's famous Copacabana Beach. They need it. It's been almost a year since Flor de Lish, a glamorous and mysterious singer come star of Brazil's blossoming Pentecostal movement, leveraged her flock to win a spot in Congress on a tough on crime ticket under the country's hard right leader, Jair Bolsonaro. And strange things have been happening ever since. A spate of attempted robberies has hit the couple's home in the high end neighborhood of Niteroi, and one of their dogs has been poisoned. Anderson, a slick-haired sermonizer, some 16 years his wife's junior, claims he's been the victim of no fewer than six attempted assassinations himself. Some point fingers at the couple's 50-odd adopted children. Others are worried about old friends Anderson left behind to hop into the religious limelight. And in Rio, you can never quite rule out all-powerful and violent gangs. Niteroi might be something of an ivory tower, but it's just a stone's throw from the boneyard of the Red Command, a terrifying new force swallowing up the city's narcotics industry. That beachy drive, therefore, is a chance to leave those worries behind, get some sea air, and, as it turns out, a little bit of marital fun. Anderson and Flor Delish park up between a row of cars and begin kissing. He kissed me a lot, she later says. I sat on the hood of the car and we had intercourse. Love, Flor Delish asked her husband afterwards. Tomorrow we'll wake up early, right? As the couple head home, Flor Delish worries they're being tailed by a motorcycle. But after a half hour ride across the Guanabara Bay, they're home. Flor Delish goes inside to check on the 22 kids still living in the couple's mansion. Anderson, meanwhile, hangs back in the car's driver's seat and clears up some late night emails. Around 3 a.m., gunfire breaks out in the property's front lot. Flor Delish hears six shots in total. She rushes downstairs, but it's too late. Her husband, the mega pastor, is dead, his body riddled with 30 bullets. Many of them appear to have been directed at his groin. Flor Delish is stunned into silent grief. At this moment, reads a family statement issued soon after, we hold the hand of God and beg for his comfort. Pastor Anderson was fulfilling a marvelous ministry, redeeming souls in the fight against hate due to an absence of God. Brazil's Pentecostal movement, one of the biggest and fastest growing on earth, is shot. Another grim act of bloodshed in a city that's seen far more than its fair share. Soon though, cops begin turning their sights on the family home itself. Fags don't add up, and evidence suggests that the poisonings, the threats, and Anderson's killing, they may all have come from the exact same person. Welcome to the Underworld Podcast. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the show that dives into the darkest corners of global organised crime. I'm your host in New Zealand, Sean Williams, and I'm joined today by Australian author and journalist El Hardy, whose 2021 book, Beyond Belief, gets into the incredible rise of Pentecostalism and megachurches worldwide, and all the crazy grifts and crime and violence, and of course, tongue-speaking salvation that comes with it. So, welcome to the show, El. I guess we should start by telling listeners what Pentecostalism actually is and kind of why you chose to write your book when you wrote it. Like, How big is this thing around the world? Sure. So it's about a third of the world's two billion Christians. Uh, but in 1980, it was only about 6% of, of global Christians were Pentecostals. So to have expanded that much in, in 40 years is, is really substantial. And it's particularly expanding in the developing world. So sub-Saharan Africa, but also Latin America. And in Latin America, it's really converting Catholics, existing Catholics. And so, so you're really undoing 500 years of Catholicism in 40. And so that's having really, really profound effects on politics, culture, society. Uh, it's leading to people like, like Bolsonaro, really, who, who, who 
came to power on this evangelical mm. wave. And I think uh, something like forty uh, percent of the um, of the parliament in in Bolsonaro's term was in the evangelical caucus. Uh, so, so yeah, it's it's had this really really um, profound effect. So, so we're talking probably. I mean, I, I say in my book about six hundred million. That's a very conservative figure. I, I think it's more likely to be closer to seven hundred million now. And they're converting about 35,000 people a day. So that's two Madison Square Gardens. That's um, the capacity of Lords, if you're in England, <laughs> and change. Um, so, so, yeah, it, it, it's just really, really massive. And, and what the Pentecostal faith is, so it's a, it's a branch of the evangelical faith. So most evangelicals, you're born again, you know, you get dunked in water, you take Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Pentecostals go a step further and say that you then need to be born again in the Holy Spirit. And that's what's really profound about the faith. So the Holy Spirit winds up filling you with the nine gifts um, of the Spirit. So it's things like um, wisdom, knowledge. You could put me in Guantanamo, I'd never get all nine. Um, <laughs> uh, healing, miracles, um, and speaking in tongues, which is how a lot of people know uh, Pentecostals, even though it's not as common anymore. Yeah. Um, and what it has really meant in, in effect is that it kind of becomes like a, a populist religion. It, it looks and feels like the local culture. It's really, really authentic. It's not being brought down from Rome. And this is why it has um, real resonance in places like Brazil. So it, it's, the, it's the faith of the favelas now. You know, in the old days, yeah, your, your, your local priest is, is educated in Spain or Portugal. They're white and they're just dropped into your favela on the edge of the Amazon or, or in Rio. Um, now they're a kid that grew up on the streets with you. They're the most charming guy in the village. Um, they're mixed race. They look and sound like you. They're not educated, but they're, they, 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 you know, they, they speak from, <laughs> they speak from the streets. They speak from the heart. They, they give sermons that are meaningful to people's lives. I've, you know, sat, sat through some really profound sermons where they're talking about, you know, oh, people are spending too much time on Facebook and things like that. So they're really contextualizing faith in, in people's lives. And, and they're, they're offering, so the, the big three things that they're offering are, are health, wealth, and authenticity. So um, healthcare mm. by, by way of miracle, um, wealth by way of prosperity gospel, and, and then this authenticity. Um, and so, so that's why it's having this really, really profound effect in it, and it's changing the global religious landscape. I guess American listeners will be familiar with your sort of higher digit televangelist guys on on at weird times of the day sort of trying to sell you stuff and i don't know jim backer style selling what does he sell like survival buckets of sludge or whatever that guy does i don't know but it, but it definitely has like a different color in other parts of the world right and like you say it's it's kind of more like grassroots up sort of religion. Yeah, very much so. I mean, the the guy who brought Pentecostalism basically to, to Brazil, um, Ajir Macedo, is a billionaire and owns one of the big TV stations. And he has the, the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God. If you walk around London where I am now, you see it everywhere. Um, it, it's all in America as well. Um, but but they're kind of outliers and, and they're equivalent like Joel Osteen or someone in the US who was recently found to be hiding money in his walls and has that you know that horribly plastic smile yeah, and that um, yeah. that sort of soft focus you, you know look to him um they still are probably kind of the outliers i mean the uh, even in the u.s a pentecostal preacher is is more like a paula white cane who until she became trump's advisor you know people at southern baptist and stuff like that looked down on people like her she was from mississippi she was poor she was speaking in a you know particular vernacular she was doing the, you know, would break into tongues and things like that and, and, and really rapturous and ecstatic form of worship that, um, that yeah, a, a lot of other evangelical Christians sort of look down on. Um, but, but yeah, they're, they're very much, you know, th this is mainstream global Christianity now. Um, and, and more often than not, the, the preachers are, yeah, the, the, not necessarily the little guys because they always you know, seem to do fairly well for themselves, but, but not everyone is, yeah. Is is eight figures wealthy and, and flying around in private jets? So let's get to the the the, the killing that that we went into in the cold open of this show. Um, this sort of mega celebrity death in Brazil. Uh, you've got Anderson de Carmo de Souza and Flor de Lish dos Santos de Souza. I'm I'm butchering horribly uh, Portuguese uh, the language, but. 
tell tell us a bit more about these two people, how they came to be so prominent, and they're kind of they're they're celebrity in the favelas and 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 in the various echelons of society in Brazil. Sure. So, Flor de Lish, again, I'm my apologies for my pronunciation. <laughs> Uh, was a gospel singer who, you know, came came up through her favela, um, grew up, you know, shockingly poor. I think her father and brother died in a car accident. That was when she found God and, and converted to Pentecostalism. And she was a gospel singer and she had this incredible sort of rasping, sort of Bonnie Tyler kind of voice. And she sort of got into the movement at the right time. And I think they, you know, they were doing some break dancing and sorts of things like that at her church. and. And just once again, contextualizing, you know, it wasn't just these boring hymns in Latin or whatever and, um, and developed a real following for herself. And she was, she was married and had three kids. And then, uh, at some point she, she went through some sort of divorce and then wound up, uh, remarrying Anderson and he's 20 years younger than her. And in time when they were sort of young newlyweds, uh, they wound up adopting 51 children. The story goes, as she tells it, that one night they were lying in bed and heard this commotion outside and all these kids had, had run away, I think from a group home or there'd been some sort of, been some sort of incident and, and all these kids were sort of on her doorstep, I think 30 odd kids, and she took them in. And then she kept taking in more and more kids and she sort of became famous for this. For this act you know she was brazil's mother teresa they they made a biopic about her and uh, a lot of actors refused to be paid because you know they thought it was you know it was doing service and and helping her do the lord's work and and these were quite prominent brazilian actors as well and so they they became you know sort of um, yeah famous famous for this act their church was was really really growing i think they'd expanded to so so anderson um had become a preacher <laughs> during this time as well so they they'd started this small church in their favela and and we're really growing it. I think they had five branches around Rio and they were sort of moving up in the world. You know, they'd sort of got out of, got out of the favela and, um, and had this house where, you know, somehow there were 55 people living in it. And on the back of her fame, I think for, for, from the biopic, she decided to enter politics and she ran for, um, for federal um, parliament in the Bolsonaro election in 2018. And she sort of wrote, rode the tide of that evangelical wave that I mentioned earlier. So something like ne nearly 200 of, of the 500 uh, deputies, I think they're called, um, were on this evangelical caucus. And it's quite famously actually how, um, why WhatsApp had to change their policy of how many messages you can forward. Because everyone in Brazil uses WhatsApp and it used to be unlimited forwards. And so there was just all this misinformation going around that, you know, they're, they're going to make your little boy wear a dress to school and things like that. Mm. And because this basically sort of rigged the election for their evangelicals and, and Bolsonaro, they, um, WhatsApp changed the policy. So I think it's only 32 or 64 people you can forward a message to now. Uh, but that's just by the by. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so, so she's entered politics. They're, they're really capitalizing on their fame. They're, they're really quite adored. You know, they're a success story. They pulled themselves up from out of the favela using God. Um, this is, this was the, you know, this is the Bolsonaro image of, of how Brazil should be. Anderson was rapidly growing his church um, and, and starting to fall out with old friends, with a lot of people in the congregation who'd help him grow the church, who'd been volunteers and stuff. They I think they felt that he was getting a bit, um, a bit money hungry. And, and, and just sort of obsessively growing the church and, and really sort of micromanaging Flor Delish's career in politics. I think they, they really, you know, saw this window to capitalize on their fame and, and they really wanted to, to, to do something and become, you know, even more prominent in Brazil. Around this time, um, sort of 2018 to the early 2019, something started happening to Anderson. Uh, he'd been poisoned probably more than once. Uh, so with the family dogs, there'd been a couple of failed robberies, which, you know, aren't exactly uncommon in, in wealthy areas um, of, of places like Rio de Janeiro. Um, there was all sorts of stuff happening and he was very suspicious. The police had given him some warnings. He was a bit reticent to heed them about, about who they were, um, you know, who, who might have been behind some of this stuff. Uh, then in, in June 2019, he and uh, Flodilish just went out, you know, on a date one night. They're at Copacabana Beach um, and they were on their way home at 
at two three a.m. And they they drove into their uh, into their garage in you know quite a quite a nice area, quite a nice house. And she went inside the house. He was sitting in the front seat, sort of half getting out and just saying, oh, "I'm just sending a few emails." And he was attacked and uh, and shot multiple times. A uh, floodless ran downstairs, you know, saw what had happened, called the police. A very hysterical front page news in Brazil. Um, yeah, it was a it, it, it was a really big deal. Um, mm. And at, around this time, I actually went to um, Brazil to to you know start looking into into this whole murder. And what started happening was it was it sort of just started unfolding on the front pages of, of the newspapers. And from the start, the police were, were pretty sus. Um, when you start a robbers, traditionally, um, you know, if they, they shoot in panic, they don't tend to shoot 30 times and they don't tend to aim um, so many bullets at the groin. Um, if you, you know, are lying in wait in someone's garage to rob them, the family dogs don't tend to stay quiet. And what happened as this was um, unfolding, uh, was that some of the the kids started to be implicated in what had happened. Um, and at this time, I probably should say that, that Anderson um, was actually once one of the adopted kids. So Flor Delish... Uh, yeah, I wondered when we were going to get to that. <laughs> to, 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 yeah. build, to build the network. Flor Delish's uh, daughter, Simone, from her first marriage, um, was in a relationship with Anderson when they were teenagers. And he wound up coming into the family home and then getting into a relationship with her mother once she'd adopted him and then they wound up getting married <laughs> um, so it's a bit <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, it's a bit crazy and complex so she was 20 years older than him um and he was yeah he was a very strict disciplinarian um you know it turned out there was there was a lot of resentment from the kids things were were you know pretty awful for all the you know glowing movies and stuff about them um you know there were there were basically tears in the household of how the kids were treated so so the the actual biological children were the highest they had a secret language they lived in you know very different way there, there were some other kids who were able to be promoted to that level but most of them you know lived basically in, in squalor uh, in one floor of this three-story house they were only allowed to eat things like like macaroni and hot dogs um, some said that they were beaten with baseball bats if they weren't um, well behaved. And there was also all sorts of weird sex freak stuff uh, going on oh, well, um, between, <laughs> yeah, 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 between Anderson, some of the adopted kids, between Flor Delish and some of the adopted kids. Um, it was all, yeah, it, it was all very, very weird and horrible and, and, and various guests in the house. Um, had yeah we're, we're involved and it was just all it was all pretty um sordid and horrible so in the end five of the children were arrested and that's when they really started squealing and so the police launched an operation called luke 12 um and it's from a, a line in the bible where, where jesus tells his disciples um there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known what you said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roots. Um, and what I that mean, was alluding I, to, I, which, I much which was, pre I much prefer that to like some sort of operation, hard, like hardened edge or something boring like that. This actually means something. This has got something to do with the actual crime and and the church. It's cool. I like it. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there was something um, kind of charming about it. Yeah, but like, yeah, but in the US, it'd be like Operation Bald Eagle or yeah. <laughs> um, something. Yeah, and this is just very, um, yeah, Brazil around this was just, it was all just kind of one giant telenovela and, and it was kind of there as it was unfolding. Um, and, and what this was alluding to was that they were closing in on, on, on the real perpetrator, which was Flor Delish. She had, uh, she'd put the kids up to it, basically. Um, in the end, uh, 10 members of the family were implicated, so that, that's 20% for, for those keeping score. Uh, it, it appears that Flavio, which was one of her biological kids, did the shooting. They had, um, her biological kids in particular, had, had real resentment about all the adopted kids. You know, they kind of felt as though they'd sort of lost their mum. Um, but, I mean, it, it was a pretty bloody strange upbringing anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, various kids had, you know, one of the adopted kids had bought the gun, people had, had disposed of stuff. Uh, Simone, her biological daughter, Anderson's ex-girlfriend, as we might remember, um, had, had one of those, 
great moments when, when police took her phone and her computer to look into things. There were, you know, a million Google searches of um, poison, how to do, and, <laughs> you know, gun, where to find, Oops. and all of those, uh, <laughs> all of those great things that, uh, yeah, you guys, you guys can get made into a t-shirt, right? <laughs> She's. I mean, she's and, got. A, she's uh, got a pretty good. She's got a pretty good motive of all of those involved. I mean, I, I've. I've got the most sympathy for Simone, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, she. She was still um, loyal to her mother to the end, uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, and, and her Very mother sweet. was actually convicted in November and sentenced to fifty years after sort of quite protracted legal case and um, a lot of Instagramming about her innocence and and whatnot. Um, and. As it sort of turns out, the police had long suspected that. So she, um, the incidents, um, you know, the poisonings and everything started happening to Anderson a few months after she entered Parliament, and and the police have always suspected that she entered. She found out about parliamentary immunity, which is offered um, in Brazil because uh, there's so many you know crooks in Parliament basically, yeah. and so you can basically <laughs> and there's so much um, pork barreling and things like that that has, has to be done that you can get away with, um, with anything basically once you're in parliament. And, and it, it's long been suspected that whatever was going on with her and Anderson, um, and that, you know, seemed to be a lot of issues of control and sex freakery and money and all those sorts of things that, that she'd entered parliament thinking that, you know, she was going to commit the perfect murder and, and get away with it, uh, by, by, by virtue of, of, of being, um, of being in parliament. So that's yeah that that's the story so it's only just still winding up in brazil and it's sort of captivated um the country for gosh the um the best part of four years what was it like to report out there like how how were you how close were you able to get to the case like who were the sort of more colorful characters you were able to get get a hold of yeah so it, it was during the pandemic um so it was really tough because brazil had had very strict laws about um I mean, just even getting in and, and, and having to wear masks everywhere and, and things like that. Um, so I wasn't able to get to the family because um, there was, yeah, the investigation was underway. <laughs> At least 20% of them were in jail. <laughs> uh, but I was, able, <laughs> I was uh, able to speak to a lot of people who'd been involved in the church and knew the couple fairly well. So, I mean, most of my, my story um, is, is sort of sourced from from then and what what was going on but also just the i mean the whole media circus around it was just was just crazy and just sort of following it day in day out it was on the you know it was on the front pages um and everyone in brazil was was, was kind of talking about it so i mean it was is you know just kind of fun to be fun i guess i don't know if that's <laughs> that makes me sound like a sicko but you know it's like as a no we can say that on this um, show. Yeah, I think people <laughs> know what we're about. <laughs> Um, uh, but, but yeah, just watching something uh, unfolding in real time was, was pretty crazy. And I've actually just found out, I think HBO Max has made a series about it. Oh, really? Okay. Well, not sure. yeah, I was just, I was just catching myself up on it yesterday and, uh, yeah, it looks like they have, um, but I, I don't think it's much good from looking at the ratings. Yeah. I mean, so. I think we can just tell people to ignore that and read your book instead. That's far better source of, of course. information. <laughs> um, as, yeah. Well, look, as I always say. You don't have to read the book. You just have to buy it. <laughs> um, so in, in Latin America, Central America, Brazil, all over the, the region, there is a kind of link between sort of organized crime and the church, the evangelical Pentecostal church, rather. Um, Danny actually has done a, a, he did a documentary a while back about um, how the Pentecostal church in El Salvador is kind of lifting people away from the gangs. Um, is that something that you've seen in your reporting quite a lot as well? Like this kind of nexus between the church and gangs trying to, I don't know, some, some in it, some out of it and, and this kind of world. Yeah. So, so in, in, um, places like El Salvador, it's, yeah, you kind of go into prison and it's kind of, you, you know, given two options. Um, and it's, yeah, get in with the, the churchy guys or get in with the gangs. Um, in Brazil, it's much more blurred inside and out. So. Since 2016, there's been this phenomenon in Rio um, of, of Pentecostal drug dealers, um, or I think evangelical narcos, I think they're, they're more traditional. Yeah, that, that, that phrase did, um, uh, that, that pricked my ears up when I was reading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I was yeah, trying to speak to some of those guys, but, uh, but wasn't, wasn't able to and was kind of limited in, in how long I could stay there and try. Um, but yeah, there's one guy in particular called, um, and apologies again, um, 
Pachiel, Pachiel, it means big fish. Um, and he's a really, really well known, um, basically drug lord in, in Rio, but he's kind of got, um, franchises in, in cities all over the country now for, for want of a better word. And he's been very prominent, um, in this evangelical drug dealer movement. Um, and so what's been happening, so say in Pachiel's kind of part of, you know, favelas, you know, that they'll sort of have a, a, a block of, you know, an area that, that they control. Um, so they control the drug trade. They, you know, have, have lookouts everywhere. And um, what one of the things he does is that he won't allow people in his areas to practice traditional African religions, which are still often practiced by a lot of, a lot of people who came over in the slave trade. So Candomblé and Umbanda. Um, and so it's, fair, you know, sort of um, uh, similar in origin to kind of what you think of as voodoo religions and um yeah they're, they're west african and still practiced uh, by a lot of people and um these groups that are loyal um to Peshiao and other similarly minded kind of guys um think yeah his foot soldiers are called the army of the living god like this guy is a true believer and so they go around attacking people who are doing these ceremonies um and you know so it's sort of driven a lot of stuff underground but then they'll even go around and attack priests you know some of them are, are old women um, that they've been going around and, and just, just attacking and destroying their, their, their temples and their offerings and things like that and, and beating the crap out of them and, and telling them, you know, this isn't going to happen here. And Peshiel, you know, he, he writes some um, psalms, you know, they'll sort of just be a, a, some sort of, you know, street building and he'll have, you know, the text written up of psalms and stuff. Um, they actually raided his, his hideout in, I think, 2021. And he calls it the Israel complex. Um, and yeah, they sort of, you know, they stumbled on his lair basically in, um, in, uh, one of the favelas in Rio and, um, it's f filled with Israeli flags, which is sort of like a totem of, of the Pentecostal movement. It's quite bizarre. Yeah. Um, and all sorts of, um, star of David iconography. Um, they found this bunker with all, all his ammo, bulletproof vests, a copy of the Torah. He had this like gigantic fresco um, of the old city of Jerusalem around the outside of his swimming pool, um, and, and yeah, this is um, this is this is a real phenomenon in um, that that's uh, going on now. And yeah, I think he's yeah, his guys are called the the Jesus Crew. And <laughs> in 2019 alone, and this was kind of riding the rave of Bolsonaro, where you know everyone sort of had license to to be a prick and and you know do whatever you wanted. Um, it seems like there was there was at least a hundred um, of these attacks on the Candomblé and Umbanda wow. faith people. So that's that's what like one every three days. So so it was a it was a pretty pretty big phenomenon. Yeah, you, um, but you, yeah. You, <laughs> Sorry, go on. No, I mean you mentioned in the book, which is really really fascinating, that this is not confined to Brazil, right? This attack on indigenous or animist religion practices. Uh, I think you mentioned in Papua New Guinea, there's been. A big wave of sort of desecrations of traditional religious sites and things like this by i mean essentially pentecostal gangs running around and, and beating the crap out of people which is pretty crazy i mean it, it kind of makes sense i guess in certain in a certain way but it's 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 kind of nuts how this is transferred in such opposite sides of the of the world yeah it's happening in in so many places so um yeah, there was in Brazil, uh, actually the Speaker of Parliament wound up attacking some traditional um, masks, I think, that, that were hanging in, in, in the Parliament. Um, in Outback Australia, there is a Zimbabwean male preacher and a Tongan female preacher who have converted um, a lot of people in an Aboriginal community, yeah, I think a couple of Aboriginal communities. And they've started, um, yeah. you know, the, the own Aboriginal people have started desecrating their own um, traditional sort of meeting spots and 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 totems and things like that. Um, in Angola, there's been a lot of um, anti-Catholic kind of stuff going on, you know, Portuguese country. Um, yeah, and, and so it's a lot of people traditionally um, turning on symbols of, of traditional culture. And th there is just something about the evangelical movement that it is... Um, you know, you know, they say the the, um, the the zeal of a convert that really just sort of seems to sharpen the mind and for people to want to dispense with the old stuff. And and the reason why, I mean, when it, traditionally Catholicism and, and, and other faiths like, like that have been able to sort of be syncretic with traditional beliefs and, and the traditional communities, but evangelicals, are, and, you know, Pentecostals particularly just, just won't have it. And a lot of it is, you know, it, it's just infringing on the business model. 
if you have a traditional faith healer or, you know, an Umbanda old lady who says, oh, okay, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to light some candles and do some traditional healing on you, that infringes on, on the, you know, the health and wealth promise of, of the Pentecostals that I was mentioning earlier in Brazil. But, but yeah, look, I think just, just going back to the, to the drug dealers, um, yeah, because it does sound like such a contradiction of terms, but I was speaking to, to people in Brazil about it and they, they were sort of explaining that, yeah, you've got to think about these guys, you know, they're essentially militia leaders. They are, you know, in their, their corner of the favela, they, they are running the streets. They are, you know, they're the biggest employer. They are, you know, they're essentially political figures. They, offer, you know, Peschial sort of tries to say that he's a bit of a Robin Hood figure, that he's providing the services, he's looking after the people. The streets in, in his area, he's, you know, quite famously is always saying, my streets are clean, that they're, they're all swept, you know, there's no, there's no rubbish around. Um, and so they're kind of, you know, these guys are, they, they think that they're like Elon Musk. <laughs> And, you know, so, so of course, you know, they say, oh, I'm the biggest employer around here. I'm the person who's got everything together. And, um, you know, they, they put their dicks on the table for a living. They're, they're going to have pretty <laughs> strident moral, moral <laughs> and yeah. social views. And so when, when you kind of think about it in that regard, like it actually does make quite a deal of sense. And, and I mean, there is a lot of conflict with, with some of these guys. Um, you know, some of them will say um, uh, that, they, you know, they're, they're trying to stop torturing people that they'll offer them a way out or, you know, that they, they do it in the most humane way possible. And, and I'm sure that there is probably um, a fair bit of psychology going on there. Mm. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's real and it's happening. And, uh, and like I said, this is, this is mainstream Christianity now. And, and I guess this is just one expression of it. It all, it all feels so sort of near apocalyptic um, reading your book as well. <laughs> like it's all it's sort of like eschatological iconography and, end times i mean you know holy roller drug dealers is quite the image in its own right um i guess like to to move on to another part of your book as well um there's another part that, that references guatemala which is another country that's kind of gone through this whole well phase series of phase shifts in its recent past including a really bloody civil war um do you want to just tell us a bit more about that that chapter in the book and kind of how that that ties into to kind of the rest of the movement, I guess, in the region? Sure. So in June 2020, there was a video that went viral online um, of a man uh, of a, a Ketchi, a, an elder from the Ketchi people called Tata Domingo Chokche. Uh, he was set on fire uh, by people in in his village, and um, it's a it's a 28 second video. Don't recommend watching it. Um, it's just sort of this fireball of, of running through through the uh, on this sort of football field and no one helping him. And he'd been accused of, of witchcraft and, and dousing gasoline. So I, I went out there to to investigate it because Guatemala is. Um, I mean, if Brazil by sheer numbers is the most Pentecostal nation on earth by percentage, Guatemala is. Um, so something like at least 60 percent of of Guatemalans are Pentecostal. Um, the faith didn't, you know, really come to the country until 1976 when there was an earthquake that, that left a quarter of the population homeless. So once again, this has just been this, you know, huge rupture in um, 500 years of, you know, sort of syncretic Catholicism with traditional Mayan beliefs and stuff, and, and it's having this, this incredible effect. Um, so Tata Domingo was uh, quite a prominent traditional healer. He was really renowned throughout the country. He was working with um, local people at uh, university, with international scholars on, on you know, bringing back traditional medicine and, and traditional ways of life. Um, and he lived in, in a small town called, called Chime. Um, there was a lot of local stuff going on. Um, so I went out there. Amusingly, the, the guy who took me out there was a local part-time reporter and part-time clown for hire, um, and, and he took, took me out to, to the town, and there was, there was a, lot of, a lot of competing narratives, um, shall we say, and there was, it, it seems like Tata Domingo um, was maybe struggling a bit with the booze, um, and he had been involved in a, in a dispute with the local family, but the way that that, that, that escalated um, was by them saying that um, he was he was witchcraft he was he was a witch doctor and he was practicing witchcraft and um, in the middle of the night sort of a, a local vigilante group went down to the cemetery found some guy there and 
depending on who you speak to, um, probably tortured him, got him to confess that he was doing the work of Tata Domingo, who was doing, you know, something at midnight around the graves. And um, and so the, the community called a, a town meeting at the, the football pitch for 5.30 the next morning. They had some people come over from a local village to, to mediate. They still sort of, um, this is a very remote village, uh, sort of near the Belizean border. But this is, you know, really, really out, out in the sticks. And so there is some sort of, um, so there's local traditional sort of legal mechanisms and things like that. So, so this is how village disputes are, are sorted. So they had some elders from another village come in to preside over, over his witchcraft trial. And whatever happened, it had been agreed that he would leave town. Um, and that was... You know, it was all supposed to be resolved. And then some people um, who were the children of the man who was having the dispute with uh, threw gasoline over him and, and lit the match. Um, and so, yeah, it was, you know, absolutely horrific death. Um, and, I mean, what what's interesting, for, for want of a better word, is that these sorts of assassinations, broad daylight more often than not, for, for reasons of, you know, to terrorise people, have been happening all throughout Guatemala over the last few years. Mm. Um, they've been targeting um, traditional traditional priests and traditional faith healers. One guy, I think six months before Tata Domingo was killed, was, was you know executed in, in the head, um, walking down the street in the middle of the day. Um, there was another, a really cool um, young rapper that I spoke to, um, Tuza Khan, um, who had his house set on fire because he put up some traditional um, no walls of snakes, which are particularly... Um, seen as you know a symbol of evil by, right. by pentecostals yeah and so yeah there's sort of been this slow campaign of of assassinations um of people practicing local cultures that are that are really terrifying a lot of people and, and it's really bringing back a lot of a lot of memories of of the guatemalan civil war which was the dirtiest of, of latin america's dirty wars yeah and, and and that war in itself was kind of tinged with a sort of evangelical religious seal right because you had Ephraim rios mont who was the this kind of like incredibly violent uh, military leader who was briefly leader of the country in the early 80s. Um, the, quote, the quote that I pull from that chapter is just incredible. He says, a Christian should carry his Bible and a machine gun. Um, so sort of like, you know, sending people out into holy warfare. Um, and that really, it was kind of like a, it was very kind of end timesy as well, right? It was, this is the old world, let's kind of install a new religious and sort of theocratic regime almost and it seems to have is that is that kind of carried over into this sort of trend or is it a continuation or is it something completely different yeah so so it really started with the 76 earthquake the only people who were really able to get into the country to help provide aid um was a, a californian pentecostal group that became known no, known locally as el verbo or the word and they had a lot of connections to prominent American evangelicals and the Reagan administration. And so, yeah, there, there's some, some talk that, you know, the people in, in high places were kind of pulling the strings. So they arrived with a little bit of aid and a lot of Bibles and started converting people. But, but then it was um, Rios Mont, or he was known, known locally as uh, Dios Mont, because he used to give a Sunday sermon on, um, on TV. And uh, when he came to power in 1982, he had converted to Pentecostalism after actually having an election stolen from him um, in the 70s. He, he went to the US and, and converted to Pentecostalism and, and came back. Um, but he'd also trained at, at the other great American institution, which was the, the School of the Americas, that, you know, pretty much any um, horrific dictator in, in Latin yeah. America in those decades had, had trained at. And I think most of his administration had as well. So, yeah, there, there's some pretty nasty ties there. Uh, but yeah, he came to power and basically presided over the, the, the bloodiest nadir of, of that war. So there were about 200,000 people killed over, I think it was 36 years of, of the, the civil war. And it was yeah. kind of, you know, obviously much more compressed into the middle. Um, and 43,000 of those were killed in, in Rios Mont's 17 months in power. So it, it was horrific. There's a, a Truth and Reconciliation report um, that I think was done in the 90s. And, and, and just the... Uh, it, it, it is horrific. It, once again, I don't recommend reading it unless you absolutely have to, because it's kind of, yeah, I kind of had a dead eyed stare for a few days afterwards. Um, I mean, there were 69 massacres in his first hundred days in office. Um, uh, he wiped 206, uh, sorry, 626 villages off the map. They just don't exist anymore. 
There was, you know, babies having their heads caved in, um, you know, villages basically all being sent into a church and having it set on fire. It, it was absolutely horrific. And one of the things that, that was happening and one of the reasons why this took on such a religious element was that sort of fighting the right-wing governments that had been put in there by, by American coups that, that started in the 50s. There, there became a coalition of, of left-wing um, militias and activists, students, some Indigenous people, and eventually the Catholic Church had come in um, with liberation theology in the 60s after Vatican II. And so the Catholic Church was seen as communists, as part of the opposition. And so when, you know, this new Pentecostal faith came in, they, they were seen as, as directly opposed to each other. And I, I spoke to, to an American nun who's been there, um, who's been living in Guatemala, in rural Guatemala since that time. And she said, yeah, people just said to her that they were, you know, militias were coming door to door and saying, Catholics don't get killed. Uh, sorry, Catholics get killed, evangelicals don't. Which one are you? And, you know, most people, uh, um, quite understandably, <laughs> yeah. converted. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it has that um, incredibly blood-soaked history that a lot of Indigenous people are feeling like it, it, it's returning now. Um, you know, in, in the last 10, 20 years, people have been able to return to their Indigenous faith. They're, you know, they're, they're often syncretic with Catholicism. They've been able to start practicing Indigenous um, medicine again. People like Tata Domingo, and that was why he was seen as such a trailblazer, because he was one of the guys really sticking his head up and saying, it's okay now. Let, let's remember this in our lifetimes because we don't want to lose this knowledge. Mm. And, and so it's, yeah, it's, it's you know, it, it's really terrifying people. It, it's sort of a, a low-key terror campaign that, that's going on in broad daylight. And, you know, I spoke to a very brave villager who, who had me out to his house, um, Pedro, in, in Chime, and, you know, the whole town was looking because, you know, a strange car had come in and they just knew that, we you know, someone from out of town was there. And he very bravely spoke to us and, and he was a, he'd been a, a mind priest and someone who, you know, was a guardian of traditional language and, and he wasn't practicing anymore. He said, you know, everyone's, everyone's practicing Pentecostalism since, since Domingo got killed out here. Wow. Um, but yeah, he, he said, you know, I'd, I'd love to go to the Catholic church and remind, uh, sorry, to the Pentecostal church and remind them that, that in the new constitution, since the civil war, I'm allowed to practice any religion I want, but I think that they'd kill me. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's interesting. I was just thinking about my own reporting in the Philippines as well with the drug war that's been going on for the last, what, seven years now, maybe eight years. The, 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 the Catholic Church there has played such a key role in trying to oppose it because of Vatican II and liberation and the, the, like, um, everything that, that went on back in the, what was that, the mid 60s? Was it Vatican II or something? Um, and, and, it, and there as yep. well, there has been a kind of evangelical backlash against the Catholics as well to sort of support the drug war, but even by the, you know, by the kind of 4D chess that goes on with the drug war there, it's sort of often the people who are actually ferrying the drugs that are for the drug war because they can eliminate their rivals and therefore they're against the Catholic Church who are trying to hold back this wave of killing. It's really, there's such an interesting kind of confluence with the different denominations and, and various kind of criminal waves that are going across the world. Um, I mean, is that something that you've seen? I mean, you went all over the world for this book, so and you've you've been all over the world. I mean, you're you're usually on the move somewhere. Where was it? Ethiopia last, and um, that that sounded like a fascinating trip. But yeah, I mean, where have you seen this? This where else have you seen this kind of mix of crime and and, and, and Pentecostalism and where these two worlds collide? Yeah, so, so the Philippines is interesting. I think that's that's potentially the next Brazil in terms of just rapid mass conversion of Catholics to, to Pentecostalism. It's sort of underway at the moment. I didn't get a chance to go there for my book. It was somewhere that I had to scrap because of because of the pandemic, because um, it was closed down for so long. But, but I mean, one of the really prominent guys who helped bring Duterte to power was um, Apollo Quimby. He's a, um, he's a prominent preacher from southern part one of the southern islands uh, mindanao, mindanao or, yeah, yeah. Might, i don't know if it's mindanao but anyway um you know and he said he once stopped an earthquake by yelling at it okay um, and as recently, we've all done that yeah <laughs> yeah well <laughs> um i think he's recently been uh convicted of uh some child sex offenses so he's oh, not as okay. prominent anymore see how he fights yeah, those yeah, charges then guy. if he's got superpowers yeah yeah and yeah i mean speaking of the catholic church uh, and that is something that has you know helped drive some people to conversion as well away from the Catholic Church was a lot of those sex abuse scandals. Um, 
But as we're finding out at the moment, they, they're certainly not confined to, uh, to the Catholic Church, unfortunately. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the Philippines is really happening um, in, in terms of conversion. And, and, and yeah, there always is just that, that very political worldview that really aligns with that sort of radical right, with the Dutertes, the Trumps, the Bolsonaros of the world, which is just, you know, more police, lock these guys up, you know, no social intervention, those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, so in, in um, Ethiopia as well, that's another rapidly Pentecostalizing place. So, so that's why I've spent a fair bit of time there lately. Um, the president, your mate, um, Abiy Ahmed, oh, yeah. is, um, is a Pentecostal convert. So he's kind of a classic, actually very, very sort of African case. I think he had a Christian mother and uh, so an Orthodox Christian mother and a Muslim father. And he converted when he was a young man at university, I think. And that, that's quite a, a common path. And I mean, he's, he's probably the most um, prominent Pentecostal leader in the world today. And he's currently presiding over five civil wars in his country and, yeah. <laughs> and, and they've been as horrific and bloody as anything. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, he's, you know, Ethiopia is again, just rapidly Pentecostalizing. It's about a third, um, Pentecostal now, a third Orthodox wow. Christian and a third Muslim. Yeah. And once again, this is, I mean, you could literally count on your, on your fingers, the amount of Pentecostals were in the country in 1950, because there were, there was a family of, um, Finnish missionaries <laughs> and, and, <laughs> And now it's just, yeah, it's just this incredible, um, just this incredible force. And it's, you know, all about um, uh, not drinking, which Pentecostal and Ethiopians really, really like a beer, as, as you might have, yeah, <laughs> you might have really noticed when you were there. Yeah, yeah breakfast beers um, have done <laughs> me in more than once. And um, yeah, so there's a real thing, yeah, Pentecostals won't drink. They're sort of becoming quite prominent in the business community. Um, they... Uh, you know, sort of overturning traditional ways of, you know, if you come into some money, giving it out into your community, and now it's just sort of like, no, 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 this is, you know, this is all mine. I, God, you know, God bestowed this blessing on me. Um, and yeah, so, so there, I mean, there's this, this, this huge revolution happening there and it's led by, you know, the, the, the preacher in chief and he's really about sort of bringing, sort of turning prosperity um, theology into, into politics. Mm. And you know, he's, he's just, you know, thing that he's kind of um, coined, right? This sort of like prosperity gospel, but also like politically uh, non-aligned. Almost, it's like he wants it to walk the line between capitalism and communism, or something like this. And it's it's kind of his own unique path that's really, really like riven through with religion the whole time. Yeah, I tried to get a ha uh, my hands on a copy of, of his, yeah, sort of, it's like your green book or your red book or whatever, that, that's his philosophical traps there. It's never been translated into English. And it's widely rumored that that's because it's uh, heavily borrowed from, from some, oh. some English texts. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, but, but yeah, he, he's got this real sort of, um, I think he's, is he the prosperity party? Is his political party? I think that sounds um, and, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really just, again, it's just all that, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, get your shit together, go to a church, yeah, lay off the drink. You know, these are just all the simple things that you can do to make your life better. And, I mean, kind of the annoying thing for someone like me who, you know, sort of believes that, yeah, you know, government should help people do that kind of stuff is that it actually kind of tends to work. There was some really fascinating research out of out of Brazil, actually, that, um, yeah, people get their lives together when they go to a church. You know, they might stop, you know, your idiot husband stops gambling or whatever. Um, you're not drinking on Saturday night because you're getting up to go to church in the morning. Churches are offering, you know, some basic forms of childcare. So if you're out there working three jobs or whatever, your kids aren't running around on the streets. And, yeah, people just tend to get their lives together and, and they sort of wind up forming solidarity networks. And and your, your local preacher will sort of be more like a mentor. And they'll say, you know, oh, you hate your job at the factory, you know, go open that little fruit juice store you've always been talking about. And, you know, and then it'll tell the whole congregation to go and buy their stuff there. And so, yeah, people, and, you know, so they sort of have this thriving business all of a sudden, you know, they're, you know, not, lo they're not losing half the family and come to gambling. Everyone's happy. And, and yeah, people do tend to get their lives together. And one of the things that, that this research in Brazil found was that, yeah, when, when the economy goes down, um, church attendance goes up. So people obviously need these these solidarity networks and these church networks yeah. for for material reasons as, as well as spiritual reasons. And and so that's why the the Abiy Ahmeds and the Bolsonaros of the world can just sort of point to this and you know and say, yeah, you don't need social programs. Just just get your ass to church. 
It's so, so that's it's why similar, it's, it's, similar it's really, yeah, of, joining with, with sort of the right, the right wing of the world. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to the kind of way that young people join gangs as well, right, and the cartels. I mean, especially in South America, I mean, people, a lot of, like, cartel leaders have openly advocated for people going to church and kind of having a set routine and not going out and getting pissed all the time. It seems to go hand in hand in many places. Um, yeah, it's interesting kind of confluence. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's bad for business. Um, and, and like I said, yeah, when you sort of think of these, you know, cartel leaders or local militia leaders as the biggest employer, as, you know, the sort of political figure around there, yeah, they're, they're behaving like an Elon Musk or, or someone like that. They're not a, um, yeah, they're, they're not sort of a, you know, cartoon godfather kind of figure. So we're openly saying on the podcast that Elon Musk is a cartel leader. I, uh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> well, yeah, if, if you're in business in America, baby, uh, you probably are. <laughs> I mean, no one he hangs around has got the attention span for a 45-minute show anyway, so they won't be listening. <laughs> um, That's right. De the defamation law doesn't exist in America. No, We're no, fine. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, El, where are you off to next then? What's what's next up on your agenda? Um, I'm actually in the process of moving back to New Orleans in America. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm doing uh doing a story on the gang war down there actually um which is which is quite interesting it's the the murder capital of america now um so so yeah going back there to do some interesting interesting stuff and also uh working on a podcast on the vatican financial scandal oh right which has That's been really um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh yeah they they invested a lot of uh money there's a big trial going on in vatican at the moment and uh they invested a, a heap of money in some shady london property deals um this is about 725 million in all as well as you know a bit of oil in angola all, all the sorts of things we like to do to diversify our portfolios uh but yeah there, there was a 400 million dollar us uh property deal involving a, a property in chelsea in london that went south with some uh you know, all, all, all the, all the, all the good stuff that gets our attention, some shady middlemen, um, some mm -hmm. corrupt cardinals, uh, a lot of people clipping the ticket, all the good stuff. <laughs> well, we'll look out for that. Um, but thanks for joining us, Elle. People should go out and buy your book and then chuck it in the bin and buy a second one maybe, or buy a third one. I don't know. Uh, but definitely That's make right, sure you read yeah. one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thanks for having me, man. Cheers. Cheers.